Hey, everybody, and welcome back to episode four of HR Evolution. It's a revolution of HR for the evolution of business. And we sit down with thought leaders today, um, possibly the godfather of people analytics, Max Bloomberg, um, is going to be joining our show and is here with us today. Um, And a little bit about this project. It's a passion project of Chris and myself and Bobby's to really uh, reevaluate the role of HR as its function within the organization's today, um, understanding how we can provide value back to the key stakeholders as well as the CEO um, and, and ensuring that we're always providing value not only to the CEOs and the executive leadership team, but also the employees. Chris, I wanted to introduce you. Why don't you introduce yourself to the audience and share why you uh, accepted this passion project with me? <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Kevin. Pleasure to be here. Really excited about today's episode as well. Uh, As Kevin said, we're looking to change HR from a more transactional, tactical type of uh, function into a more strategic value-added function. And that's what these sessions are all about. It's also about upskilling all of us as HR practitioners and professionals. And we're just going to dive right in. So we are super, super excited to introduce all of you today. Our guest today, as Kevin said, is Max Bloomberg. He's a consultant and a founder of the People Analytics Think Tank, the Bloomberg uh, Partnership. And in that partnership, he works to bridge the world of business performance, artificial intelligence, and analytics to improve strategy execution and design effective workplaces. He has developed and authored tools such as the Human Capital Value Profiler and the Digital Era People Analytics Operating Model, or the DEPA OM. I'm going to keep going because it's really, really impressive. Over the course (laughs) of his career, Max has worked at Accenture. He's also worked alongside a bunch of blue chip companies and global clients, including, but not limited to, CIPD, the BBC, Hilton Hotels and Resorts, Barclays Corporate, and Friends Provident. That's not all. There's more. As an (laughs) academic, Max is a visiting professor at the University of Leeds in the UK and a researcher associate at the University of Southern California here in the States. On behalf of Kevin and myself, Max, we want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and talk with us today and welcome, welcome you to the show. Dudes, thank you so much. You know, those are such good words. I'm, I'm tempted to put them on my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> I think I might have taken them from you. Yeah, 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 yeah. that That's way you did in about good. 10 minutes of the first episode there with all his yeah, accolades. Yeah. Max, uh, when can we expect uh, that new album to drop on uh, iTunes? I know you're a bit of a musician. I've been waiting yeah, patiently yeah, for that new episode. Now, Chris didn't mention that at all in his piece, you see. So you kind of you kind of think that uh, that's escaped. Well, I, I have a recording studio uh, set up here, like a whole oh, nice. setup, and uh, I still record, but my other work, analytics, etc., takes up a lot of my time. You know, like like most of my contemporaries, I'm I'm going to be writing novels soon. <laughs> As I, as I as I hit my my third middle age crisis, <laughs> yeah. for our, for our audience, Max, let us know. Okay, and then we'll just spend one more question on this before we get into the heavy stuff. So, what kind of music musician? I remember seeing a picture of you a while back. You were doing some Zen, you know, transcendental Zen. meditation yeah. on a van or something like that. What kind of music are That's you into? Amazing. Kind of so, what? I kind of developed my own style. You, you could, it's it's rock basically. Okay. Uh, but I evolved with with because I'm that age. I have kind of evolved through Bob Dylan, who who I see is getting a bad rap these days, and then <laughs> Eagles, David Bowie, nice. uh, and then developed into my own rock style. Had one hit, uh, uh, which of was, which was because somebody bet me a very bad thing to do. Somebody <laughs> bet me that I could not write a hit. And I said, you know, I think they knew me really well, actually, because they knew that if they told me I couldn't, then I then I would. What was the title of that song? I wrote it on the spot, you know, there and then. Oh my! What was the title? Three a.m. in the morning. Yeah, yeah, it was good. That's amazing. That's amazing. So as I am not jokingly saying that you, I, I do view you as one of the godfathers of people analytics and it's, it's analytics that has changed, right? The naming nomenclature of people analytics or human capital data, whatever we're calling it. Um, you've really been at the forefront, both on the academic side, um, but also applying what you're learning in the academic side into real life. And I think that that is unique, right? I think a lot of the authors that you mentioned there's a lot of people that talk in um, perfect state, right? Um, yeah. Not real world. 
Uh, we know that HR practitioners want to get to some of these strategic initiatives, but they just don't have the time or the skills um, in order to properly upskill themselves and get to these more strategic initiatives. Yeah. What was one of the coolest projects that you were able to apply people analytics to and what was the monetary impact? Well, I mean, the one that's most publicized, uh, there've been a number uh, at various places like Nestle, um, Vodafone, Barclays. But the, the one that I think was the most sophisticated project was without a doubt a crowd called rent a kill Initial, who, who are, I think people in the States would know it as Orkin, probably part of yeah. the Orkin best, etc. Yep. And And what I love about that project is when I was called into it, because, you know, you said I apply academia. So just taking taking a step back from that, a lot of academic research, I mean, you're, you're a biologist, Kevin. So, so, you know, a lot of research is done in artificial environments. Mm -hmm. And if you're a psychologist, for example, all of your credits will be earned from doing – experiments on other students in the class and there isn't a lot of real world in fact even if you do your phd it'll often be on what we call you know convenient samples of, of students um but my phd right from the outset took me into the real world where i was looking at couple relationships uh, which i mentioned to you guys earlier um and because of that I started not working in that environment. I was working with real data, not artificial data. So at the end of that, um, and I think I would never remember the year, but I reckon it was around 2009, 2010, um, this guy called Steve Langhorn, who was then head of HR um, for rent kill in the UK, said, you know, Max, um, I've seen, your, seen you around somewhere or other. And we've got a problem with our sales uh, that we're not hitting targets around the world. And you're a psychologist, uh, and I think it's a psychological problem. And uh, you're a statistician. I think it's a stats problem. Could you solve it? Now, remember, in 2009, there was no such thing as concept as people analytics. Mm -hmm. So all I knew how to do was kind of the scientific method or what you do in a PhD. If you haven't done, for those who don't research, you know, you, you set what is the research question, what's the outcome we want, and then you make some hypotheses to guess what might be causing the outcome, and you got, and you test them. So that's all I knew. And I went to Rentagill, basically. I applied the scientific method and got – the answer about the sales, you know, it was that the personalities uh, are, were not consistent around the world so that some countries were doing it really well and other countries were doing it really badly. It was, in fact, the Dutch guy uh, who said to me is that our problem that while we're not getting good sales is that salespeople should be eager, hungry, arrogant individuals <laughs> who love cars and money and something else, which I probably wouldn't mention on a, on a recording. You know, and he was right. <laughs> he was dead right. You know, and, and, and whereas all the others were saying, oh, it's bad training or our retention's bad. Uh, yeah. And it wasn't. They were just not recruiting the right. And so the uptick for the company was in we were able to do, unusually in a corporate in those days, we actually could have a control group and an experimental group. You know, that's one group who gets, you know, COVID and a microchip and the other group who gets nothing at all. And um, sorry. You can, you can edit that out, can't you? Uh, uh, I, I love vaccine. And, uh, and, and as it so happens, the group uh, that went through our new process as opposed to the old process um, sold $70 million more in, wow. in year one. So it was like wow. a real controlled experiment, if wow. you like. Interesting. And we used incredibly sophisticated um, – Analytics. We used a tech called uh, multi-level modeling, which is what you should all be using in organizations. As soon as there's a team involved, uh, you can't use a linear regression or multiple regression or the general linear model if you want to really sound clever when you're saying it. Um, and you've got to switch to that. And um, nobody I've seen has done anything like that since 2010, of which I'm aware. If you know if anybody's listening to this and you know of people who are using these techniques, you know, let me know because I'd like to publish them as case studies. But I don't want to kind of be the first one and the only one. That's fantastic. And the rest, as they say, is history, I guess, right? After that. So that's the rest fantastic. Of history. Let me let me ask you a quick question, Max. You had an article that you wrote about four years ago called "A Call to Arms" um, back in two, 2017. Yeah. And really, what you described was 
people analytics being segmented into three distinct spheres, right? And that first one was people who create and just publish information about it, but they don't actually do people analytics. The second group was, you know, the actual consultants who are out there doing it day in and day out, which you call the dying breed. Yeah. And then the third one was this kind of this move to the creation of software and AI and products that do this for you. But in your article, you explain that those don't always live up to the hype hmm. that they're kind of sold on. Do you think that's still true today? Kind of wow, that second? I'd forgotten. <laughs> I've forgotten that article, but it's become absolutely true. I mean, that is Zwindel, I write that, 2017. Yeah, that's right. April. Wow. Okay. I don't know. I must have had an oracle or something. The crystal ball was out on the, uh, in the recording. Yeah, somebody must have been whispering. I mean, because we've gone completely that productization Route, haven't we, or, yeah. or route, if you prefer, um, where where you you can't really hear anybody who's leading in the field of people analytics talking about people analytics, you know, without productization uh, of, of some kind, and without mm. a doubt, it's gone there. There is a lot of snake oil in that. So, for example, what a lot of people call mm. AI. Um, it's a particularly problematic area Correct. because um, you know what is AI. You know, regression, we mentioned earlier, very simple analytics technique, statistical technique. That is a technically a, a, a machine language technique. Whether mm -hmm. it's AI or not is another question. And in fact, here comes, he has a really interesting point to think about is that AI, I mean, everybody kind of knows AI and the Turing test, right? Mm -hmm. So we all know that if you can fool if you can fool the person listening, whether it's a machine or a, or a computer, then that machine is AI if the person listening thinks you're a human being. Cool. So we are hearing that organizations and HR wants more and more AI and the future of AI uh, because it will think more like a person. Well, mm -hmm. that's the definition of the Turing test. Mm -hmm. So do we really want our recruitment to be done by people who are biased? Surely we want to go above that and so this whole thing of why do we want AI when it's biased and does what human beings do? So there's a mm -hmm. we have to ask what is this AI move all about and whether it's what we really want. Yeah, That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, and it's a, it is fascinating too because I view technology as an, an enabler, right? I see technology as a way to enable those to give them time to focus on more strategic and reskilling and upskilling themselves and, and becoming more prolific or proficient with data, um, metrics and analytics. Tom One Marsden, the, one, Tom Marsden, sorry, just last point on that. Tom Marsden from Sabre once said something which knocked me out. Um, Tom said that um, data should just be another voice at the table. And what he that. meant by that was that it isn't the voice at the table right. and it mustn't not be at the table. It is one, you know, there are four of you at the table, there's three of you and one of you is data and it has a vote like everyone else. And that image has really kind of worked for me over the years. That's a really cool way to put it. And I love that because, I mean, we talk about HR wanting that seat at the table too, right? And mm -hmm. and, and, and it's one thing to have hey. a seat and be listened to and valued, or it's another thing to be uh, in the seat and be a mute Absolutely. and nobody asks you any questions anyway. So why be in that seat in the first place? Yeah, yeah. So, and that's why Chris and I are so passionate about this is that we believe that we can change the world through HR um, by enabling and upskilling them in a way to enable their CEOs and key stakeholders to make the right business decisions that are people driven. And I think that there is a wonderful, there's been a lot of history, right? You, you're talking about a project that you did and, and, and we think of 2000, that's not very long ago, 2010, 2009. Yeah. Why do you think now businesses are gravitating towards people analytics more than ever in your experience? That's a really good question. Um, I think it's part of this a move towards trying to quantify everything so that you can predict from it. So if you know whether you can predict, if I invest um, forty thousand dollars in this person's MBA, you know, am I going to get a, an ROI, you know, of two hundred thousand dollars in the first year which gives me a massive ROI and that's kind of where you want people analytics 
to go from a financial perspective, but I have strong views on whether people analytics is only for the benefit of the shareholders and mm-hmm. whether, you know, we, in capitalism, whether we need to change all of that and focus on other things, but that's another, another subject. So mm-hmm. I think there is a big drive towards it. And as Josh Burson said, you know, the journey starts by getting your data Right. Mm -hmm. And so we're at this irritatingly slow stage at the moment where people are doing dashboards with Tableau and Power Mm -hmm. BI, you know, just come on, guys, let's get on to the MLM and and some of the interesting predictions, because you're not going to make those predictions of if I invest 40 grand in somebody, what ROI am I going to get on that? Uh, You're definitely not going to get that from a dashboard without a doubt. Or a visualization. Um, I suppose more the question is that can you ever get that out of a human being? You know, how predictable are people? Isn't mm-hmm. that one of the lovely things about people is that we have the ghost in the machine? Um, and so, you know, what are the limits of people analytics? Uh, I am a psychologist, amongst other things, by background. Um, and I know that if we can predict human behavior in psychology with a correlation of 0.3, there's a lot of champagne in the department. <laughs> that, that, that is considered to be a huge win. Whereas, you know, whereas in physics, these these people, you know, 0.8, you know, is considered to be reasonable. You know, mm. champagne is 0.95, which is tautology <laughs> vir- virtually. So it's quite interesting how the differences between yeah. the disciplines um, – and so I don't know whether human behavior – of course, that's why CEOs love mm-hmm. um, love the idea of predicting behavior. But they also, even more than that, they love AI. Mm-hmm. Because, you see, although AI doesn't do great things or machine learning doesn't do great things, it also gives you really predictable results. So when you tell Wall Street, you know, Wall Street, we're going to be turning over 40 billion this year and a net return to our shareholders of 18%, you know, you can be sure if you're only using AI um, and not people that you'll probably get close to that. Whereas if you use people, the return might not be 18%. It could be 36% -hmm. or it could be 5%. But CEOs being conservative, if it hits the 5%, they're out of a job. So they'd Mm -hmm. say, you know what? I don't have to get the top figure, which I would get from the innovation that people bring. I'll settle with AI and go. Mm -hmm. And that's so, you know, our variability is both our strength and our downfall in workforces. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's great. And you, um, you you talk about the the like um, one of the things that I wanted to ask about is uh, you you talk about like the conflict, right? Um, the idea that there is um, almost like a responsibility when you, you when you have this data and you have this information. Um, it is a great responsibility. How do you protect, I guess, the employees, right, at the same time that you're doing some of these programs? Because now with the privacy disclosures and things like that, we're, we're very limited sometimes in what we can do with that information. How do we pro- progress as a function of, in people analytics and in HR mm-hmm. by still protecting the privacy rights of the employees, but finding the projects that are really going to have that monetary impact or value to the business what have you found based off your research and based off your on the job experience on how you i guess walk that fine line max that's a really good question so i mean firstly i'm tempted to say that it's quite politically driven and the reason i say that is that you know we who used to be in europe i should say living in the uk uh you know we have gdpr yeah uh whereas in the states there's no concept of no, privacy what's privacy <laughs> you know i can read i'm your boss i can read your emails i can listen to your telephone call i don't even have to give you a job i was chatting to somebody who, the other day in the states in in california hi person if you're listening um who, who's head of who's head of od and he's been there for like three years and he doesn't have an employment contract i said is that kind of is that a normal behavior he said yeah it's pretty pretty standard you know they can they can get rid of me Anytime they want. So you see, that sort of thing wouldn't happen in Europe. And Mm -hmm. so for me, uh, you know, firstly, you've got to look at why is this difference, this attitude to employees in Europe versus the States. And to me, you know, one of the main differences between the States and Europe is kind of a bit left wing, uh, left wing uh, or socialism uh, and heavy capitalism 
in its purest form. So yeah. possibly it's the political economy that makes a huge difference. So if I if I offer to help a certain airline in the States uh, to help uh, get more productivity from their workers by analyzing what kind of worker does it take to be more productive, they chase me away. They say, dude, the unions are going to kill us. Yeah. Please don't mention yeah. uh, analyzing people. And even when I did that in Europe, we were sued um, by Germany and France on, on that very rent kill project um, by saying, you know, you haven't uh, used French and German workers and you can't use generalized results. And I said, oh, but that's where you're wrong. My friend, I did use French and German workers to profile. So, well, in that case, you're not guilty. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> so we won. And, and there's a message in there: is if ever you're doing global projects, you must benchmark in the country. Do mm -hmm. not do what most um, providers do: instrument providers, you know, psychometrics or whatever you're measuring. Most of them are based on a global, uh, mm -hmm. a global sample. And I can tell you, yeah. people in France are very different to people in Germany, very different to people in the States, very different to the UK. So, you know, just for performance-wise. So anyway, so in terms of data, my approach has always been complete transparency on my projects. And we treat, it, we treat every people analytics project like a PR campaign. Hmm. I would say that the comms component of a big people analytics project is much bigger than the analytics and data and statistical part. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of emails saying, folks, this is what we want to achieve. Would you like to give us some ideas of how we could do it? There's lots of focus mm -hmm. groups. There's lots of... Um, innovation from the employees. So in that rent to kill example earlier, um, I still to this day cannot say that it was the statistics that made the difference. The fact is that in the end, when they were recruiting people, the recruitment process, I got the managers around the world to design the process. And you know, you don't break what you design. If, yeah. if an external consultant comes in and designs it for you, you're going to say, what do they know about this industry? Exactly. You know, somebody comes into ADP and says, you know, I'm, I, I'm from McKinsey. I say, what do you know about payroll? Yeah. You know, you, you're, you know, and the same with that. So you, the, the trick with people analytics is really to get the people in the organization to come up with the ideas. And mm. even if it is your idea, you're still going to make them think that, that it was their idea. And then they'll use it and they won't break it. And that's the approach to data privacy as well, saying, you know, guys, what, are you, what is your concern with that? We What's the worst we could do with the data? Um, and you get their buy-in. What does scare me a little bit is that Gen Y and Gen Z, who hate being labeled Gen Y and Gen Z, but there you are, um, is that they are far more accepting of their data being used, and that kind of freaks me out a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah. I, I can only think I was born in a time where my data really was mine and there was privacy. So I have a contrast, whereas I guess if you were mm -hmm. born in 1990, you only know a world. You don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you, know, you don't know what it's like not to have your data all over the place. It's the you know. And so yeah, I, think my, I think my wife and I just had that the other day, Max. We were talking about something for the baby, and all of a sudden all these ads on Facebook were all about this yeah, exact exactly. same thing we're in. I was like, isn't that a little weird? Alexa was listening to every yeah, word. You exactly. know. Yeah, oh, exactly. God. Yeah, yeah. But now that's a bit, that's a hot topic though, now though, Max, is, you know, AI and what is the policy and what is the governance around it, right? And I think, you know, not to give you a free plug, but we'll do it uh, on September 14th and 15th. You're going to be speaking at the second annual AI policy conference that's coming up. Uh, there was a oh, yeah. recent study um, that Gartner did saying that 16% of all companies and organizations are now starting to implement technology to more formalize and look at clocking in and clocking out, especially with remote working uh, workforces going on, um, looking at tracking work computer usage. So were you mm -hmm. on a company laptop, right, monitoring the emails and all of that? Do you think, you know, where, where are we heading with all of that? You know, what are the implications um, from both a business perspective and from an employee perspective that you see that we need to really start thinking about? Well, I mean, from an employee perspective, it's really clear that we're going back to this whole kind of tailorism where we're measuring, you know, you know right at the beginning of the 19th, I mean, the, the 20th century, where you had every time and motion studies were what it was about. Um, and we're going full circle 
uh, hmm. back to kind of that measurement. You could argue that that is what a robot would do anyway. So if you're into robotics, you know, yeah. you, you know what time a robot comes in and you know what time a robot goes out. Um, and that's really bad when you start doing that to people. It's demotivating, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, on the other hand, um, you might say to yourself, well, the nature of work is going to be different. So we aren't going to have as many mm-hmm. FTEs um, in mm-hmm. the next 10 years as we have today. Mm-hmm. You'll get a lot more people being part of a gig economy, contractors working from home. And in fact, back to our good friends in Gen Y and Gen Z, many of them prefer it because they just won't take the kind of crap from companies that older mm-hmm. generations would take. And so they're going to work as independent mm-hmm. consultants. And I think you'll be wearing multiple hats uh, and you'll have lots of kind of side gigs um, going on. And I think I don't think that the younger generations are going to put up with that being measured in and out. Now, I'm generalizing horribly here, aren't I? Because here I'm talking about Western educated kind of people not putting up with it. Whereas if you live in a third world uh, country and you're not educated, you you have to put up with whatever the sweatshop makes you do. And I think the West has got a big responsibility for sustainability and for, for ensuring that those practices aren't going on. And in all fairness, a lot of companies now uh, certainly when I sign a contract with an organization, I have got to say that no one in my whole supply chain is using yep. that kind of thing, you know, and presumably mm-hmm. if that goes right down, you will eliminate that. So it's not great. But at the same time, you guys are very interested in what is HR, what is the nature of HR. So let me just quickly point out that, do you know, do you remember the Hawthorne experiments? Mm, God, well, uh, worth, well worth Googling at some point. So around the turn turn of last century, uh, where people dressed funny and spoke funny, you, they did some experiments. Psychologists did experiments. Um, on the lights and turning the lights on and off. Yeah. Yay, that's the one. And they gave people different colored lights working on the production yeah. lines to see which color light got the most productivity. Now, if you think about what that experiment was really about, it was about – how can we maximize productivity without improving the conditions under which the employee is working exactly. or paying them more? And you think kind of like the sign on bonus right now, Max. Well, you know, <laughs> is, that, you know <laughs> is that kind of what HR is really and culture is about? Is how do we squeeze the most out of our workforce without paying them more or improving their working conditions? And if that is the culture, then you're in trouble. And I would be hard, you would be hard pressed to find a company that doesn't think like that because you have to, because you've got shareholders and shareholders want the company that gives them the maximum return. And if company A can squeeze more out of its workforce by paying them less and getting them to work harder, it will have a bigger return. So they're going to withdraw their capital from that company and they're going to put it into that one. So mm-hmm. it's kind of baked into the system, the sort of um, into the political system. Mm-hmm. It's baked in that you will squeeze. You're going to think, of course, we talk about employee experience and making life lovely. The rule is make life lovely the least amount that you can to keep them working and keep them retained. But mm-hmm. don't yeah. spend more than you need to to do that. Mm-hmm. And we talk about the financial and monetary impact and we talk about like people analytics projects, Max, that you've you've been a part of. Um, I see a disconnect right in, between HR and finance. Um, HR is kind of talking in emotions. They talk about engagement. They talk about uh, learning and development strategies, but they never go back and reassess to, to see the effectiveness. Right. Yeah. Um, is that something that you've seen when you're kind of going in and first consulting with businesses? Is that true disconnect between finance and is finance buying into the people analytics projects without that monetary impact? Or does that have to be a part of those projects in order for them to be on board? So, so where HR doesn't measure its own impact, uh, finance tends to take it over. Quite often. So, wow. you know, the examples that you're citing where you say, you know, everybody's using people analytics. Well, not so much. Yeah. Um, it's really the high profile cases that get into the media and the people that you interview on your excellent show um, that will have those cases. You're only hearing about the Googles and the Facebooks and the glorious yeah, companies. No. You know, what about the other 90 percent uh, mm-hmm. that are not doing that kind of work and measuring? Um 
And to the extent that, you know, this has been trotted up many times, but it's true, is that to the extent that HR is a pastoral function, or, and what I mean is that mm-hmm. people join HR because they genuinely love people. Uh, you know, nobody joined HR to run a pr- a process, a recruitment process, and to say, you know, are you that, and to run disciplinary hearings. Many people, when they joined HR, maybe it's less true now, um, but many people, you know, kind of thought, when do I get my Freud couch so that I can get my first employee to lie down and and tell me about their traumas, <laughs> etc. That doesn't, well, that never happens, does it? It's like when you study psychology. You know, you do your course and you think, oh, this is cool. I'm going to learn about what she's thinking in the background just by reading her face, you know. And, and all they do is give you mm-hmm. R and stats. And you say, you know, what happened to the cool psychology stuff um, that I thought mm-hmm. I'd see? And so HR has always been the soft uh, and fluffy background. Again, that's heavily changing now. Um, mm-hmm. But even so, if you look at who is running most HR departments, you know, they still, I, mean, yeah, I was going to say old white dudes, you know, it's actually old white females uh, it, it, for the most part, I bet you. I mean, I don't have a stat on that, but if you measure it, mm-hmm. and, and, and the key word there is not so much color as age. And, mm-hmm. and so if you get older people doing it, um, and I've had this quoted to me before was to say, you know, I believe in all of this data and analytic stuff, but I'm too old to learn mm-hmm. that. And I've so I'm, I'm retiring before. in five years' time. Uh, yeah. So let it be the next person's problem. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, hope, I'm hoping it will disappear uh, over a generation as the newer generation mm-hmm. comes in. And we've seen hoping. we've seen other evolutions though, Max. You you probably you saw accounting over your time. I mean, they were bookkeepers until the generally accepted accounting principles, and then we saw marketing ta- start talking finance in the '90s when they started to leverage data. What find what I find fascinating is, is most organizations are I would say are in, in my in my case are not using analytics. They're using data and metrics and dashboards, right? Yeah. And they don't they don't take the time necessary to understand well why is our turnover in the first 90 days so high, both voluntary and involuntary. They don't mm-hmm. start asking those additional questions. And I think it's a lack of HR understanding the business, right? How do we make money? Where do we spend money and how do we lose it? And then really putting that business goal like we just talked about with the scientific method. That's our overall goal. How do we get there and work our way backwards? Um, you keep talking about the multi-generational workforce and, and, and the, the understanding of the human psyche. How important do you think that is as businesses drive people related decisions? Like I see my father. My father would never leave his company, right? He is in that generation that if they yeah. just took a little care of you, you were going to stay forever. Yeah. What do you see as the biggest multi-generational gaps and differences and what should employers be thinking about today to prepare them for tomorrow with these multi-generations well i think there's a whole there's a whole study on gen y and gen z and i've got a really cool presentation uh, which i've given on that um, there are a lot of assumptions about what the differences in the generations want um And it's a huge subject, isn't it? I mean, you know, one of the most effective schemes I've seen, for example, is 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 dual mentoring, um, where you'll have a young person mentoring an older person, uh, say on technology, and an older person mentoring a younger person on common sense. Um, (laughs) Sorry, (laughs) sorry, I thought you were going to say business acumen. But, but maintaining different sets of values and standards within an organization, um, it's not easy. It's a cost to the organization. I mean, if you, why do you think organizations don't value diversity? The more diversity you have, the higher your cost. Shareholders mm-hmm. think, you know, ROI mm-hmm. is equal to uh, income minus cost divided by cost. And so mm-hmm. if you look at it in those terms, you are reducing it with diversity and things. So the trend will be to try and will always be a natural trend to reduce diversity in organizations. There will always be a social political trend to increase it and to create more Mm. sustainability. So it's like the people versus the corporation. The people do not want to see their planet dying from from lots of earthquakes and rain and terrible things happening. Um, And the corporations say, well, we got shareholders. 
you know. Yeah. And, and it's a question of, you know, one hopes that it'll be really interesting when the majority of CEOs are Gen Y and Gen Z. Mm -hmm. It'll be really interesting to see what happens. And I'm not stupid enough to make a prediction. Because uh, <laughs> even I, I can't see. But, you know, I really hope I have great faith in the younger generations. They are clever. They are savvy. They are more uh, into meaning. They are more socially considerate of mm. each other than mm. our generations mm. ever were. And that's really good stuff. You know, if that can be sustained um, in organized, in their working lives, the world should be um, a better place. I think mm. we yeah, are. So that's great. You know, Kevin just mentioned that probably a lot of organizations are not doing sophisticated people analytics or not really understanding or taking it as far as they can. And, you know, for our audience here who, you know, this might be something they want to look into, you know, looking at the steps it takes to actually create a people analytics, you know, function or process. You recently uh, posted on LinkedIn, you, you gave us a nice little seven step process you could do with the steps involved in, in the process of that. And you had things like dig data that matters is number one, you know, explore, experiment, enrich, have an action plan, avoid legal loopholes, create learner systems, build a fact-based measurable business strategy, and then take tech support. Out of all of those steps, Max, where do organizations get, you know, tripped up? Where, what's the hardest one for them to actually, you know, overcome in order to put in place you know, some form of people analytics process? I, I think that the biggest stumbling block, I don't even know if it's, I don't think it's on that list, but I, I need to do an article on this, is the ability to do reasoning, reasoning okay. ability. Um, I've got something on LinkedIn called My Career Development Forum, and we take people and we put them through a career development process. It's, it's not always that uh, well uh, attended because nobody wants to admit that they're looking for their next career uh, on, a, on a public forum, which is fair enough. So we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one with people. But when people tell me they want to become a leader, you really want to give them a test of reasoning ability. Sort of, you know, you get that in sats and stuff, don't you? Where, you know, if, if, if this person did that and that did that, who owes what to who, etc. cetera. Um, sure. And I always say to people, if you want to, get into people analytics or you want to become a leader, do a reasoning test. Um, and they say, well, that's just using logic. And I say, yes, you show me a leader that can't do logic. Um, but you can fool yourself by learning complicated statistical techniques and machine learning, etc., from a textbook. And so you read it like a cookbook. Mm -hmm. And from that cookbook, you follow the steps without any reasoning or logic exactly. applied to them, yeah, exactly. and you get terrible results. And interestingly, the average CEO of a large organization, these are clever people. You do not, no matter, no matter whether you like their values or not, that, that's a separate discussion, but you will admit that most of them are clever to be able to get there. Mm -hmm. You can show them any people analytics analysis that you've done, and they will immediately find the flaw in it without knowing a thing about deep statistics. Why? Okay. Because they've got reasoning ability. They say, but how can it be that all of the younger people are performing better than the older people? Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to give me a reason. Or why do people who are extroverts perform better than introverts or whatever it is. Um, and so what I think is missing in people analytics is that we're in a very cookbook stage of mm -hmm. people. Analytics. There are a lot mm -hmm. of books coming out to how to do regression. Chapter one, yeah. open yeah. up here, do that, open the spreadsheet, blah, blah, blah. There's no none of the thinking behind it, none of the kind of discussion that the three of us are having about mm -hmm. why are we doing people yeah. analytics. You know, are we doing this for the benefit of the shareholders are we doing this for the benefit of the employees? Are we doing this for the benefit of the planet? And once you start asking those questions, you'll suddenly discover that most of the problems that you need to solve in people analytics using quantified data, uh, mm -hmm. you don't need complicated statistics mm -hmm. for. You need a couple of graphs. You need to listen to what people are saying, and you'll get most of the answers. So when I see people chasing deep rabbit hole statistics, uh, I kind of say, what are the questions that you are not answering? And what are you hiding by doing this deep stuff in mm -hmm. your organization? What are the other things about your employees that we're not hearing about, mm -hmm. for example? Mm 
So and is it almost is it almost a fear, Max, that there are uh, HR practitioners? They, they we've never we've never been held accountable, right? We're not held accountable to a, to a, a definitive number like the generally accepted accounting principles, right? That that was a metric a, a measurement for that entire department. I, sometimes I feel like HR practitioners and teams are afraid of what the data will show, right? It may show that they're doing a poor job. Um, is that something that you're finding is sort of part of their resistance from peeling back that onion? Is they're maybe afraid that they were telling the CEO for the last couple of years that the culture was great, we don't have any problems because they're only telling the, the leaders and the stakeholders what they want to hear? Is that what you have seen based I mean, off of I've that? literally I've literally had one head of L and D when I offered to do some measurement work. Say no thanks. Nobody asks for it, and I get a huge budget every year. You, know, you, <laughs> you, you could be the end of my huge budget. So you know, the last thing I want to do is measure it. So you know, there it is. So much for the learning organization and people yeah, want, right. wanting to find out. I don't know whether it's deeper than that, Kevin, and I don't know how far the culture goes back. But you know, to the extent that HR is associated with uh, labor and helping the workforce, et cetera, it, it technically is not in – it's not on the same side as the shareholders mm -hmm. because employees are a cost. When mm -hmm. I mean, who when employees' salaries are cut, mm -hmm. who complains about that? I mean, if there's a union, the union will certainly let you know that there's some mm -hmm. unhappiness about the cut. Yeah. But if there's no union, a lot of people thought that it was kind of HR's job to say, but we have to look after the people. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe there's that sort of tension is that we aren't uh, a quantified um, discipline. Peter Cheese, who is the CEO uh, of the CIPD, is a very brilliant mind. Um, and I once said to Peter when I was working there, um, should we not have two HR functions? Um, mm -hmm. Hi, Peter, if you're listening to this because you're about to shoot me. Um, you know, should we have a soft pastoral side, half of HR, mm -hmm. and then the hard strategic part, mm -hmm. you know, in other words, shareholder versus employee? He said, if you ever say that in public, Max, you know, you, you are dead. Because the last thing we want to see is HR being split into the functions. Yeah. But whether you split it or not, to me, those tensions exist. Is oh, yeah. that there are a, a, a camp of HR people who see themselves on the side of employees and who want to help when mm -hmm. they see yeah. wages being reduced. Um, and they can't, of course, they can't say much, can they? Because they're also employees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so yeah. they complained about it. Their jobs are out. And so in HR, you're kind of bullied into going along with the organization. Right. But the slowness with which it's happening, to your point, Kevin, might be some of that resistance mm -hmm. going on. You can tell I'm a bit of an activist at home. Yeah. No, well, Chris and I are both too because I think it's the only way to really improve yeah. I mean, what businesses are doing yeah. today. And we're all working towards the same goal. We have different objectives to achieve that same goal, but we're all working towards that common place. Exactly. One of the things too that I wanted to, uh, to ask you is um, there's a lot like – I would say in most HR practitioners and, and, and people alike don't really understand the difference between data, metrics, and analytics. Um, so that I think there's a, also a learning curve that needs to happen. You are obviously very prolific in the space, Max. If we were to teach our HR um, audience today, um, if they wanted to become more comfortable with data and more comfortable with analytics, what are some of the first like low hanging fruit projects that they could get their hands wet with or dirty with first and see a monetary impact that would encourage them to continue on and explore and see what else they could do within their organization? Do you have any well, ideas are, or tips? Yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, one of the simplest projects that that I encourage people on on courses where, where I've taught this um, is to say, why don't you look at uh, people's performance ratings However, you get those. I have a particular way of getting performance ratings, um, but get you know the manager's performance rating, and then get a measure of their competencies, and track those over time. So if you measure it, you know, kind of in twenty twenty, um, Chris's uh, performance rating was eighty percent, and his competency was seventy percent. A year later, his performance rating was ninety percent, and his competency was 80%. So they both increased. A, a basic thing that you can look at is, are employees' competencies and performance increasing or decreasing at the same time? 
because you've got a heck of a problem on your hands if someone's competency is increasing and their performance is not increasing. Because why are you spending money on developing competencies that don't have an impact on performance? And Hmm. if someone's performance is increasing and their competence is not increasing, are you working on the right competence? Because something is making their performance increase and it's not on your radar. You're not measuring. So that's one of the most basic things with people, with employees that one can measure is this relationship between competence. And that is really, by the way, the technical definition of HR. HR is that function which provides the business with the right competencies, which happen to reside in human capital, with the right competencies to deliver the organization's performance objectives. That's that's why HR is there. You know, you do that through recruiting the right people, Mm -hmm. through providing the right training, through providing the right career development, the right succession planning, et cetera. That is HR's role is to provide a set Mm -hmm. of competencies at the end. Mm -hmm. And to be strategic thinkers to understand what jobs could be potentially strategy is the alignment. Yeah, strategy is the alignment of competencies with organizational mm-hmm. outcomes. So yep. the process I just described is by its nature. So yeah. the question is: Does HR every year read cover to cover the business strategy and to say, right, these are the competencies we'll need to execute the strategy. We got a lot of work to do on this workforce. Mm -hmm. We're going to need to change our recruitment process to get that. We're going to need to change our training pro. We need to change that if we want that. That is strategic thinking, but how many organizations do that? Yeah. Yeah, not not many, and a lot, and some aren't being listened to, and some some aren't understanding the business because they're so focused on the tactical administrative work that they can't seem to pick their heads up. Um, mm-hmm. One of the last questions that I had before Chris asked the the final question of the episode is, um, I was listening to one of these uh, uh, speaks uh, talks that you were giving um, that you talked about uh, two commodity industries. So I'll, I'll use Pepsi and Coca Cola, right? If Pepsi copied everything to the recipe, to the, got the Willy Wonka chocolate factory menu of what's going on over there. You say that despite all of that, and we know this to be true, that they will still not get the same results, even if they copied it verbatim because of a little thing called your enterprise capital framework, which Chris and I talk about a lot about is that applying that intellectual capital, like we were talking about earlier to mm-hmm. the stats and the data and the analytics, because what we've learned in our day jobs makes that data now have insights and from insights we can then then take action. You talk about intellectual capital, you talk about using people analytics. Do you feel like this intellectual and tapping into this intellectual capital is essential for businesses today in order to be prepared for what's coming tomorrow? And how do businesses ensure that they are starting again, do you see people analytics to give them a competitive advantage in pulling that up? So that's a really great question. The mo- you guys have really done your homework because I mean that <laughs> that is something I said long, long time ago. 2014 or 11, I think it was. Yeah. yeah, I mean, but but it's truer than it's ever been. It, exactly. Currently in 2021, the best intellectual capital still comes from human beings, and hmm. so one of your roles in an organize in, in, as a people analytics person or you know or an hr function i have real difficulty separating the two functions by the way because they kind of one enables the other um, y- your job is to find competencies that enable the organization's objectives as we said earlier on a lot of that enablement of objectives is going to be related to innovation for starters mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and to the extent that machines in 2021 are not really good at generating innovation, comp- AI mm-hmm. is not mm-hmm. yet innovative. You're mm-hmm. still going to need that from people. So the last bastion of people, you know, once we've automated everything, yeah. innovation probably, I never say, never say it won't ever happen that AI won't do innovation, but the last bastion will definitely be human beings. To that extent, People analytics and HR have got to become really good at saying which people are likely to generate Hmm. the kind of intellectual property uh, that we need. And you use Coke and Pepsi as an example. And I think the original example, and you can search for this, it's in Harvard Business Review around 2000 and 
somewhere between 11 and 15. The story, it was about Southwest Airlines, I think, and United probably. Yeah. And, and the question posed was, if you took all the systems from United and transplanted everything exactly to another location, you know, into if Southwest copied it, would Southwest become exactly like Delta? And the answer is no, because mm -hmm. there's kind of the structural capital, what you call the enterprise uh, structure, mm -hmm. or the enterprise capital. Um, and a lot of that resides in the people, by the way. It's the mm -hmm. way that things are glued together. The it's intangible. also the, the, the trajectory that they took in development leaves organizational memory um, mm -hmm. in people. And that side of things, organizational memory, structural capital, is very seldom looked at in people analytics. So if you want a quick, uh, my view of the future, where is people analytics going to go? Because that's where this is leading. We, you know, we've spoken about all the fancy AI um, and the regressions, uh, etc. The, the next big step for people analytics is going to be looking at things like organizational memory and looking at how culture impacts the effect of competencies on organizational performance and measuring that. And there are a lot of culture measurement tools, but nobody looks at cultural memory where you say how far we go back. And the other, the next big discipline change in people analytics is going to be a move away from predictive analytics, which is kind of seen to be the top now, yeah. um, onto prescriptive analytics. Yeah. Now, people have thrown that turn around a lot because, you know, it's always prescriptive, predictive uh, uh, yeah, descript descriptive, predictive, prescriptive. But nobody really knows what prescriptive mm -hmm. analytics means. Mm -hmm. um, and predictive is as far as we've got because AI does predictive and regressions and all that kind of stuff. Prescriptive analytics is simply says that we've got so much resource available to us in the organization. We've only got so much. This is the number of With that resource, we have got to satisfy our shareholders. We've got to satisfy our employees. We've got to satisfy the planet, etc. What is the best possible mix of our current resources which will allow us to optimize the output for the shareholder and the employee and the planet? And that discipline is called optimization. And it's quite completely separate discipline. Um, to, to statistics, and I only discovered it by sheer luck because I did a degree in maths a couple of years ago, and I saw that there was a course called optimization. I thought, oh, that looks really good. I needed a filler course, and that was my filler, and my eyes kind of opened that there are people looking at that, and it's all about resource allocation. Yeah. So the new people analytics, I believe, is going to be about optimization, and that's kind of what we mean by prescriptive, mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. we tell the audience that this is how much you need to put into people, this is how much into AI, this is how much into the planet, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And we, Chris and I, want to see HR on that side. We want to yeah. see HR for the revolution of HR for the, for the evolution of business, and we feel like HR being the people people, uh, in most cases, they're, they're far removed from the people. Totally. And, and, and very involved in just the the day to day activities of of maintaining the the function of the business. Um, I know Max. I was blown away. I have about fourteen different pages of notes right now. Um, <laughs> I would love to uh, continue to learn from you, but I I, I really think our we, our audience got to learn a lot today. Um, we hear yeah. terms. We hear almost like uh, a lot of trend uh, following right uh, on LinkedIn. You you mentioned in those three different buckets of, of people talking about people analytics is that there's a lot of talk, but a lot of less action when it comes to utilizing this at the end of the day. Yeah. So I hope our audience was able to, to hear from Max and to understand how he applies what he's learning in the academic space and teaching in the academic space and really bringing that I, um, to the real world. I will make an offer to your listeners and to you guys uh, if you want it. At, um, you just need to find the right time. I, I have a special calendar which I make available uh, to people, as does Dave Milner, uh, my colleague. Um, and we have, uh, at no charge, confidential career development conversations with anybody who wants them. You know, I do mine at 7 a.m. UK time, which is not always a friendly U.S. time. Dave does his. But, and I'll generally be out on the road running or walking if I'm doing this or on my uh, elliptical trainer. And we have, you can speak to some of the people that have had them. We have great far wide ranging conversations and the questions are how do i get into people analytics what do i need to learn mm -hmm. where do i go you know um 
and I'm I really am keen on watching this new generation get into the subjects we've been talking about. So it's an offer to anybody who wants that. Uh, uh, Chris and I will be signing up for that Saturday. <laughs> <Sunday, you laughs> it might Why be late for us fathers, but we Why might be up. <laughs> We'd We're love in. to have you. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Max, thank you so much for your time today. Thank this is guys. fantastic. Yeah, really Max, thanks again so much. Really you have enjoyed. a great day, my friend. Enjoy and uh, such a pleasure to learn from you today. Great pleasure. Thanks very much for having me. I really enjoyed the discussions. Beautiful. Yeah.